Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Bris Science for November 2015. Thank you all coming along tonight. I think we have an almost full house. There's just two or three spare seats around. So that is a fantastic turnout for a talk about maps. So tonight we're going to be talking about how Google Maps has changed the world. And so we have a series of four speakers, and we're going to take you on a little bit of a journey. Um, before I get into that, I would just like to do a bit of housekeeping. First of all, if this is your first Briz Science, thank you so much for coming along. We do things a tiny bit differently from some of the normal talks you might have been to. First of all, is we would love you to have your phones out, but on silent, and you can tweet about the talk with the hashtag Briz Science. And there will already be some tweets going on. And you might see that our panellists tonight might even be tweeting from the stage, um, depending on the topic. So they're not ignoring you, they're just being, you know, connected. Um, tweeting is also important because we take questions a little bit differently. On your way in, you would have seen a box with some pencils and question slips. And so throughout tonight, we're going to have four speakers. Um, if you get inspired and you want to know more about something, I'd love you to write down your question and at the end, we're going to have a bit of a panel session. We will come around, collect those questions you've got, and we'll get through as many as we can before the night uh, is over, at which point we'll head outside for some food and drinks and a chance to talk to our panellists a little bit further. So there will be plenty of time for that afterwards. Um, OK, I think that's all the housekeeping to start, so let's get going. So thank you for coming along tonight. Tonight, as I said, we are going to be talking about how Google Maps changed the world. And we're going to take you on a little bit of a journey around geographic information systems, this way that we map out the world using technology, past, present and future, and how some of the different applications that maps, particularly Google Maps more generally, are now being used for in technology. And we'll have some great demonstrations and so forth. I'm gonna introduce our speakers uh, one by one as they come up, um, but it would be my great pleasure to introduce, first of all, Alexandra Greer, who is a senior consultant at Esri Australia. With more than a decade of experience, Arx has held technical and project management roles in countries all around the world, including UK, Australia, Asia Pacific, Africa, the works. So it's my very great pleasure. Could you please welcome Alexandra Greer? Gear, pardon me. All right. Hi. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so my name is Alex and I'm a senior consultant at Esri Australia. So I was a very late addition to the program and I'm not going to talk about Google Maps. So I'm actually, I'm going to talk about uh, maps in general, geographic information systems in general. Um, so in my day job, I, um, that's my desktop, um, but in my day job, I work with mapping technology. So um, I help our customers use location to make better business decisions. Um, Esri Australia, we are the local distributor of the ArcGIS platform, so if any of you are familiar with that. Um, so I pretty much believe that location is critical to most decisions, and I get really sad when people don't have maps in their life, because I just don't understand how they do things if they don't have maps. So um, when we sort of talk about people using maps in business, so, um, you know, it might be, you know, optimising routes for your fleets of vehicles. It could be about, you know, providing a real-time view of your assets um, or your people. We could be improving communication, so, um, you know, telling stories via maps um, or streamlining our workflows. Now, as I said, I was a very last-minute addition to the program, so when I found out that it was how Google Maps changed the world, I've actually taken a slightly different view. I'm going to flip that around and I'm going to look at it an historical event and a well-known one, and I'm going to look at you know, what we might have done if we had our modern mapping technology available at that point in time. So I'm going to need you to use your imaginations, uh, um, overlook some technological limitations that would have existed at the time of this event, and also excuse my bad puns. So, um, and the key point, the reason that I want to do this is I want to sort of demonstrate um, how mapping technology has become such an important part of our daily lives. So, let's set the scene. Come back with me to uh, Pompeii. And, uh, you know, since it was settled, um, the region around Mount Vesuvius and the Bay of Naples attracted wealthy vacationers. They wanted to soak up the sun and the scenery. So by the turn of the first century, Pompeii, which is about eight kilometres from the mountain, was a flourishing resort. 
Um, elegant houses and villas line the streets. And so uh, this is a 3D replication. Oh, thank you. Um, so this is a, a 3D model, um, a, a recreation of the town of Pompeii. Um, so on the 24th of uh, August, so this is our real history before we take a look at the alternative. Um, so the volcano erupted and it spewed tonnes of molten ash, pumice and sulfuric gas into the atmosphere to a height of 33 kilometres. So the firestorm um, engulfed the surrounding areas and it suffocated the inhabitants of Pompeii. The cities were buried. Nothing remained to be seen of the once thriving communities. Many people escaped, however, those that stayed behind were crushed or buried alive. So 16 years earlier, there'd been another major earthquake and there were still signs of damage. So early signs of the eruption included that there were a series of minor earthquakes and underwater groundwater resources um, ran out several days prior. So what could our alternative history look like if we had mapping technology? Could we have saved the landscape of the towns? I think. I think we probably know that we couldn't have. But um, advancements in the use of technology, particularly location-based technology, um, can help to deliver effective strategies in emergency management. So it can provide a mechanism for us to share information to the public ahead of time and deliver situational awareness as these events unfold. So, like I said, just overlook my other technological limitations of the fact that they wouldn't have had the internet. Um, but what if they had GIS technology? So Pompeii wasn't just a port town, it was, uh, it was a portal town, it had an information portal. So the residents could access information on their tablets at, uh, at, any, at any time, because everyone, uh, everyone has a tablet these days. So the modern Roman town uses geography and mapping as a way to engage the community and share the information between the residents and the authorities. So this is the Pompeii portal. Um, it's got uh, authoritative community maps. It's got location-based apps uh, that are helping to inform and connect the public with information. So some examples here. Bath finder. So where's your nearest Roman bath or uh, leisure centre? What's on at the amphitheatre? Top 10 shows for summer. And obviously general tourist maps. Now it's not all gladiators, fighting and chariot races. The residents of Pompeii live in the shadow of an active volcano. So some of the capability of a modern GIS platform includes bringing together different types of information and data to deliver a more complete situational awareness. So, for example, we could crowdsource data, um, we could use predictive modelling, and we can have live, live feeds, and we bring them all together through the frame of geography. So in the event of this emergency, the portal provides that mechanism to facilitate two-way information sharing with the residents and the holiday makers. So the key thing that I want to draw your attention to here is that we would have an early warning system if we were using modern GIS technology. So I mentioned earlier that there was a previously a major earthquake and it had caused a lot of damage 16 years prior. So some of that damage hadn't been repaired. So in our real history, it's said that the uh, Romans grew accustomed to uh, these tremors over the years and that they, they were just part of living in the region and they became complacent. So in our alternate history, these are monitored very closely and a damage assessment application available. So residents could report damage through a map interface and the repairs um, that impacted on the evacuation routes were prioritised, so they got fixed more quickly. Additionally, uh, we analysed those tremors and we did evacuation planning so that... Uh, as soon as we identified that, you know, through the early warning system, we could evacuate the town. So how did we communicate this information to our residents? We've got a public information app, and if any of you work in government, you know you've got to have a witty acronym. So this is, we've got MAGMA. So this is our major alert ground movement app. And let me just open that up for you. So. A resident can search for their search for their location. And then we can identify oh, we're in a red zone. So uh, if we uh, just click on that, 
it'll give us our evacuation status. So it's going to tell us, like, we have to evacuate now. So follow evacuation procedures. Um, check Mapus Evacuatus for our safe routes. <laughs> now, I talked about bringing in real-time data or live feeds. And um, so we've got some tweets that are coming in. Sorry, I'm through my hotspot. So let's just click on this one, see what it says. Oh, OK. So uh, be sure to check out the top 10 shows at the amphitheater. The plug, hashtag summer of 79. Okay. That one's not really useful to us. Oh, wait. Did anyone else feel that tremor? So Pompeii, earthquake, magma. So. We've got that real-time information coming in, and that's that two-way communication that I was talking about, which you can facilitate through you know, mapping applications. So another feature of our Pompeii portal um, is the extensive interactive evacuation route app. So a resident can identify their location, and then based on those safe routes, they, the nature of the event and where they need to get to, um, an evacuation route will be presented to them. So there would be a couple of key differences here in Pompeii. For example, um, you could only put in a start location because all roads lead to one location. <laughs> and they didn't need turn-by-turn -turn directions. So you just get on the main road and keep going. So sorry, I am getting a little bit ridiculous here. But I just wanted to highlight how some of these location back based technologies are just an important part of our current modern day everyday lives um, and in fact we've come to expect them so more and more we're seeing map based communication from our government departments and government agencies um, and look maps are more important than ever so what's changed has geography changed not really um, spatial relationships haven't changed um, the way we think about geography hasn't changed, but GIS has changed. So it's changed because everyone now has access to the technology that was once only available in the back room. So GIS and mapping has become a commodity item enabled by consumer technology, and that's you know, where Google Maps has come in, and that's, you know, it's really changed the industry that I work in. So everyone can now do what we once did as GIS professionals, but at a lower level. And so this is sort of the rise of the neo-geographer. People's experience with consumer products are driving their expectations at work. And so as geographers or GIS professionals, our roles are more important than ever. Um, so what are we doing differently in the industry to take advantage of this sort of, you know, the change in technology? Um, we're using GIS as a platform for communication. So it's not just about being a system of record that presents static data. We're using it to communicate and make decisions in real time. So GIS itself is advancing. It's getting more powerful, it's getting easier to use. Um, it's evolving, it's got lots of new capabilities, and it leverages um, so many other trends that are happening just sort of in the technology industry. So, you know, more data, more computing, um, cloud computing, etc. So the notion is, by if we use GIS as a platform, um, it allows geography to become pervasive. You know, it creates a pervasive understanding. So not just simple static maps, but, you know, deep kinds of knowledge that we get from, from visualising information. So the other thing I'll add, um, you know, our sources of information are changing. So technological advancements are making data available every, everywhere. Every, everything's a sensor. And so more and more companies and governments are making their data publicly available, and we need to take advantage of this content to help us make better decisions. So. Maps, again, more important than ever. Um, I was, uh, just before I wrap up, I was lucky enough to see Dr. Michael Goodchild present when he was in Australia earlier this year. And one of the key things he said was that um, the future of geographic information science is going to be placial rather than spatial. So geography is providing that framework for us to bring disparate sources of information together, and we tie them together by place. So for most people, sight is your dominant sense. Um, when it comes to information delivery, you want, you want to see it, right? So maps make sense of things. They lend order to complex environments and they reveal patterns and relationships we may not have seen otherwise. So um, thank you for humouring me with our look at leveraging modern mapping technology. But um, I do think it's a really exciting time to be a geographer. So.
Thank you very much. Give it another, join me in thanking Alex Gear, our first speaker for tonight. Our second speaker for tonight uh, is, again, on the topic of Google Maps, is Chris Isles, uh, who is Place Design Group's National Planning Director and also PIA Australian Planner of the Year, pioneering work on the feasibility and commercial testing of planning schemes and planning policy in areas such as technology and planning and in the future of cities. In just a moment, we will have his presentation up on the screen. And then you'll join me in rousing applause <laughs> as the tension is unbearable. Yeah, there we go. Could you please welcome Chris Isles? Thanks, everyone. Um, I am a town planner and I am particularly passionate about maps and, and technology and how we can use this stuff, but there's no doubt that Google Maps has changed our world and I guess I'm going to pose a few questions tonight. How much of that is good and how much of that is bad? Because <clears throat> I don't think it's all necessarily tremendous. Um, I want to talk about Google Maps past, present and future because I think um, as much as we would say Google Maps has definitely changed our world, I don't think we've even seen half of what it's going to do, and I suspect most people probably don't even know half of what it's already doing today, let alone what it's going to do in the future by the time we, um, we get into it. <clears throat> um, social media matters, um, and I'm going, to I'm going to circle back later on to explain why that matters and why it matters in relation to Google Maps, but um, those are the hashtags, those are the tweets, the one at the bottom there, look, I'm just going to throw that out there, fascinating presentation. That's up to you guys whether you want to tweet that later on, but... Um, if you can pay attention to my hashtag and, and those kind of things, because it does really matter when it gets into Google Maps, and I'll explain that a little bit later on. I thought it was appropriate, though, um, that we should pay respect to cartographers past and present, because I think this is my first point around Google Maps, is that as much as I love it, I think there was a real eloquency and art to maps in the past, which has been lost. There's nothing like kind of rolling something out and feeling it. If you've never stood on the front of a car bonnet with a map laid out going, where am I? Um, as opposed to standing there with your phone, it's not quite the same. Um, so I, as much as I love what we're doing now, I think we should pay respect to the history of maps because there is real elegance to where we've come from. Um, and I think a lot of that is being lost at the moment, which is one of the, the downsides to it. So Google Maps passed. Um, most people, little subtle things don't know, the, the peg man up there, he's evolved. The new peg man is different to the original peg man. Um, most people probably don't know that, but um, Google Maps has evolved as well. So some of the stats, and this is, you know, this is not my stuff, I've just stripped this out of the internet, but some really interesting stuff here. You know, for me, 50%, 50 of the people in this room use Google Maps at least once during July of this year. 50%, um, that's around the world. You know, that's a pretty staggering when you think about it. Um, I love the fact in the bottom corner that someone found some pyramids that they didn't know existed because they found them using Google Maps and, and, and all those aerial photography. Um, so it's doing some really interesting stuff for our world. But for me... Google Maps first started as a desktop application, but its big impact upon us happened when they figured out how to get it onto your phones, and that is the single biggest change in the step life of Google um, Maps. But again, I pose that kind of question, you know, how much of this is revolution and how much of it's actually reliance? Um, I love my technology, don't get me wrong, but I'm incredibly reliant on it now. Um, when we start talking about the, uh, the zombie apocalypse is going to have there and everyone walking around with their phones going, I don't know where to go because nothing works anymore. People have forgotten how to read a map. How many people in this room, um, well, actually, probably a lot in this room, um, but um, <laughs> who, who, um, no, who haven't actually used a UBD or a street directory? If you walked up to some young generation and said, hey, can you find me a UBD? They go, I don't even know what that is. Um, and I think that's really scary at the same time. But um, these are some of the changes that I see. You know, Google Maps and, and your working day. So, Hopefully you can see that up there. But this is the way our world is now. <clears throat> My diary brings me up every day. It tells me what meetings I've got. It's now smart enough to know when I need to leave. Um, and it shows me directions and where to get to my meeting. Um, and it tells me where the people are going to be there. It knows when I'm running late. And it gives me the option to actually message the person I'm going to meet, say, hey, I'm running late. Because um, if you think about it, your map, your phone knows where you are. It knows where you're supposed to be at what point in time. And it knows you're not going to get there because it knows how far it is to where you get there. This stuff is imminently possible, and this is stuff that exists today. Google Maps and travel. Um, fundamentally, this has changed the way we travel the world. You know, you sit at home on your phone, um, booking hotel rooms. Where am I going to stay? I can check out the rooms going to look like. You can almost book, you have to almost have your entire holiday without actually going on a holiday. 
Um, and again, that's fantastic, but kind of sad. You know, you've lost that kind of joy of just turning up and being surprised. Um, and this is going to make it worse. Um, because this is a real thing, this is not me making this up. So everyone's probably seen the Google cars. Well, this is the Google bike. And the Google bike is now travelling the parts of the world that cars can't get down. Um, so can you imagine, and it probably is already the case, you know, being able to log on and look at Google Maps of the Amalfi Coast without even actually having to go to the Amalfi Coast. And is that a good thing? Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, meeting, meetups and hookups, um, you know, Again, really clever stuff. You can just sort of log on to your app. This one's a one called Who's Down. Um, say, I feel like going to the State Library tonight. Who's down? It tells me who's around me. People can log in, and then it shows you a map of where they are and their proximity to. So it's picking up proximity of your friends and your people in your circle and letting you hook up and do social things together. Again, pretty scary or pretty cool, depending on which way you want to look at it. Um, so that's kind of the stuff that's already that most people know about. But maybe some of the things that people don't know so much about what Google's doing is um, again, maps, phone, and now the advent of big data. Uh, and a big data, um, we've already covered it, is there's sensors everywhere. Um, it's picking all this stuff up. So some really interesting stuff now around maps and congestion mapping. And this happens live now. Um, if you've used your, your iPhone or, or even the Android devices now when you're trying to get somewhere, it's feeding in um, live congestion mapping. So I went to go for somewhere down the Gold Coast the other day. It changed me halfway through because it knew there was congestion ahead. So the GIS route directions are changing live and it's feeding that information. Um, and hopefully you can see that in the image up there, but this is where they're thinking you're going to get to where buses are telling you live I'm 50% full but I'm running two minutes late. And you can understand this stuff before you choose to make and hop on a bus. Um, and now this is crowdsourced versions of it. So another app out there um, where as, as a driver you can see live um, where where the congestion is, but you contribute to it. You know, you log in and say, hey, there was just an accident here, or I saw a police officer here, or there's a, um, some roadworks here. So this is crowdsourced um, congestion mapping, and this is starting to roll out more and more around the world, which is, you know, a really interesting thing that we can uh, make decisions. But again, you know, sometimes it's nice just to get stuck in traffic. You know, do I really need to know where traffic is? Um, there'd be two different views on that. Um, but when you think about Google Maps, and, and, and Google Maps is a thing, but it's actually really the bones of so much more. Um, and there's literally millions of websites now that actually use Google Maps on it. And there's as many applications. Now, all of these apps which are up there, I'm sure many of you understand or know or have used, but most people may not understand that they run on the Google Maps API, which is effectively the brain that runs them. They may not look like Google Maps, but they're running Google Maps as its geographic referencing. Um, so it's pervaded our life far more than we probably understand. Uh, for those in the room who caught your Uber here on your way to your Tinder date, you'll probably understand you're using Google Maps on a range of different devices here tonight. Um, and some of the Big Brother stuff, and I um, understand there's a lot of Big Brother stuff that gets into this technology, but now um, your mobile phones are tracking people where you go. Um, and you, mobile phone companies know where you are because your phones have got GISs in it because that's how this stuff works. Um, and they can plot you out. They know where you go across the course of a day. Um, and there's a lot of applications that you can use that for. For me, as a town planner, um, I love this stuff because I can actually figure out where people go. I know where I can make pathways and roads wider or park benches or parks and places and museums and libraries because you know where people go and gather as opposed to kind of guessing. Um, and I think that's a really interesting thing. But again, I understand there's a big brother aspect to knowing exactly where people go. Right, um, so why social media matters? Um, Clout is an application out there and they score people based on your penetration with social media and how many people respond and engage with you. And then it knows where you are. So people on Clout who have a score, I think, greater than 60, um, and I wasn't quite over 60 tonight, which is why I've asked you to tweet a little bit, but hopefully that will work. Um, when you get over 60, you f they know where you are and they start sending you offers. So, hey, Chris, come and stay at the Sheraton tonight because we know a lot of people follow you and engage with you. Can you please just do a post about the Sheraton but you can have a room here for free? Come and, come and use this car. So this is real. Like, um, so people engaging with the, the, real, the social world based on people of influence but using maps in your location to effectively get you to make decisions around how you spend your day. Um, so again, you know, interesting or scary. I think some of the, the things of Google Maps in the future. Um, so for me, the next thing is going to be crowdsourcing and how we blend all of this kind of things. Um, 
and this, op this idea of open data and how we can create maps and use open data. Um, good example of how you know, we all score cafes up here um, and give them scores and we kind of have crowdsourced maps of where to get good coffee. Um, great coffee here, by the way, um, in the city, um, in Eagle Lane. <coughs> I happen to own that cafe, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Is a great plug, I know, I had to fit in there. It was, it was a tough one for me to get this gig to plug that in there. Anyway, but um, that aside, um, smart maps. Um, and this is this kind of interesting thing around, I'm driving along, I need to park, my diary knows where I am because I'm going to that meeting, so it starts to push me messages that say, hey Chris, there's a park for you on Robertson Street in the valley, I've already kind of booked it, because they know where the sensors are because the street lights have sensors, they know what parks are available. It's kind of like that technology at the Westfields, you know, you get a green light or a red light, you know what park is available. This stuff is starting to feed through to your phones and your apps and you can start to find parks um, as and when you need it and if you start thinking about driverless cars it becomes crazy because your car will just go to a spot, you don't even need to be involved in it, but that's a topic for a different day. Um, this one, Google Potholes. Um, eloquently simple, this one. Um, the, your phone has a, has a movement sensor in it when it's in your car and it detects a pothole because it jumps as you drive over it. It reports the location, sends it back to the council to fix it. That's a true story. That's not me making stuff up, but, but why not? You know, like it's just blending such enormous amounts of technology. Um, live maps, um, now it said you can log on using QR codes to figure out where your maps and your buses are going to be, just feeding this information in. Uh, augmented reality, which is kind of the Google Maps on steroids, which is the fact that you can use your phone and you can look around, and it actually kind of takes the Google Maps in and blends it into photograph. So I don't know if you can see that up there, but it, it tells you where stuff is in the distance, where cafes and restaurants. Um, and that's an app called Gineo that I use. Um, um, it works in Brisbane, you know, that, that actually is Ben's Burger in, in James Street, that's where near my office is. So you get some really interesting stuff happening with augmented reality. So just to wrap up, Google Maps has definitely changed our lives in its first 10 years of existence, and if you can believe it's only been 10 years, I certainly can't. Um, the fundamental changes, that the last probably step changes in our world were the advent of cars and the advent of elevators. Cars made us allowed bigger cities, elevators allowed taller cities. I believe that the next big thing is going to be how we blend you know, big data, open data sources, mobiles, mapping, and augmented reality. Um, so thanks very much, and again, Social Media Matters. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Chris, and I hope everyone's got those hashtags down. Uh, if not, there's plenty of them already on Twitter, so you'll be able to retweet those. All right. Our next speaker tonight, our third speaker, is Dr. Peter Scarf who is a research scientist at the Queensland Department of Science, Information Technology and Innovation and the University of Queensland, who works to democratise spatial data, access and use. Could you please welcome Dr Peter Scarf. Thank you. That's me. I'm from the Joint Remote Sensing Research Program. So <clears throat> I guess my day job is pulling together mapping, particularly using remote sensing mapping, so from satellite imagery, across Queensland, New South Wales and Victorian state governments, the Northern Territory and University of New South Wales and University of Queensland. So I'm, I'm more of the sort of raster remote sensing spatial side of things, but uh, I've had a bit to do with Google Maps over the years. Can I use that? Yep, I can. Okay, so as we said, 10 years, and that's Google Maps 10 years ago. Um, you can see that there's a big country and there's the rest of the world um, <laughs> sitting out there in the seat. And that's hard to imagine. I find that hard to imagine. I think that you can see this web page is in Germany, in German, so I think they would have been disappointed as well. Um, <laughs> and that's 2005, so things have moved a lot and it, it, it messes with my head to think, you know, how far we've come. And I'm probably going to go on a sort of a fairly quick journey of where I see we've come over the years. Okay, so. Back then, we just had a few maps with, with, you know, a, with the United States on it. Now, we've got a whole thing, and it's not just roads that we're talking about. We've got a whole satellite image backdrop on the back there. We've got, I guess, in this map here, it's a crisis map of Australia. So we've got information on traffic, as we've heard. We've got information on bushfires. We've got information on uh, floods, other hazards, what roads are open, aggregating data from state government portals, putting it on a map so that people can use the, use the information. You can also put your own data on there as well. So you're starting to get to the point where 
For example, this is one of my recent field trips out to Injun to collect some vegetation data, and you can see where I've been driving around. Um, you can see that that's now integrated into the Google API, so I can get road directions to that point. And street view imagery that I've taken using my mobile phone is now in the Google mapping platform. And it's open to the public so anyone can see it. So my data is sitting there accessible to everyone. But what I find really interesting is that we can start to get involved, I guess, in, in some of these mapping products as well. So Google have a, a maps editor. Um, and a lot of these platforms have a maps editor as well. And so if you see a mistake, if you want to add your own place to the map, you can get in there, you can do that. It'll get verified, there's levels of trust that go up in the service, but you're starting to get to the point where it's not just us mapping geeks, it's everybody can contribute to maps. No one does that better, I don't think, than, than OpenStreetMap. They're kind of the original and, and still you know, possibly the best community mapping source. And you can see this map here. Does that come up on the screen? No, it doesn't. Um, you can see in the middle there, there's a really small dot um, right there. I put that there when it's called Mia Lake. It's on Morton Island. And uh, my friend's daughter ran down a hill and saw a lake. And it wasn't on the map, so I just added it in and called it after her. And that was four years ago, and it's been there ever since. So <laughs> you do all sorts of things. OK. The other thing that's, that's going on, I guess, is this crowdsourcing. We heard a bit about that before. So this project here. Uh, the GeoWiki, it, 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 it's an experiment in, in spatial data and, and community engagement. They ran this very successful uh, project on Facebook called uh, Cropland Capture. And you basically, it was a game. You got there, you looked at a map, an image like the one you can see there. You know, is it Cropland, is it not? Um, they offered a few prizes. They got 250,000 people submitting basically sites of whether there was crops or not. And so they could actually make a global map of the world's cropland extent, which is really useful for global food security and a whole range of other purposes. Didn't really cost them very much at all, and there was a lot of information behind it. Even if some of that information is low quality, there's enough of it there that the, the, you know, it works out OK in the end. Street View as well is, as I mentioned before, it's not just the, the bikes going around. We can put that in ourselves. So this is at the University of Queensland. This is one of the field sites that we use uh, to do field training. And I've been out there. I've captured a whole lot of street view around there. You can navigate between that. And you can basically go in and do a virtual tour along the way there. More exciting than that, though, I think, is, is the outreach that goes on. So there was a, a project called Open Data Kit. It started off as a Google Summer of code project allows you to collect spatial data on your mobile phone. A whole lot of people have picked that up, uh, taken into health. This, this is a group of kids that have basically using this technology to map the location of polio and who's been immunised and who hasn't been in Bangladesh. And the actual power of, you know, the citizens of that town going in, getting around, mapping the data and talking with the people is, you know, can't be understated. It's, it's, it's been an amazing project that's been going on. And as we mentioned before, it's not just about the maps, it's about the APIs that go underneath it. So you can build tools that, that use the location, the traffic, the geolocation, reverse and back geo, uh, geocoding. There's a whole lot of APIs which are now available across not just Google, but a whole range of platforms. And they allow you to build tools. So this is a nice tool which uh, none of you can actually see because it's, it's locked in behind the federal government who won't release it. But it's a coastal flooding visualisation tool. You can see it could be a little bit political. Um, and it allows you to, to put in, um, you know, it, it's a project that allows you to, to look at, I guess, um, scenarios of sea level rise in the future, overlay height mapping and uh, over, overlay storm surges. And with the virtual gauges up the coast, you can sort of see what areas are going to flood. The people that built this just uh, won a UN award last week for their for basically deploying this in the Pacific Islands. Um, but you can see that maps can be a bit political in, in, you know, in situations like these. You don't just have to have a server at the back end though doing stuff. There's enough technology now that you can actually do mapping in the browser. And that's kind of what I find exciting. So you don't have to have a GIS running in the background. You can get a JavaScript library like TurfJS. And in this case here, do real-time routing within your web browser, which means you don't have to be connected to the internet to to actually do mapping and computation. And the, the analytics that we've heard about before, so your mobile phone knows where you are. Don't have to talk about that. This is the bit I really like, though. I've been on this platform for a while. So you've got Google Maps, and then there's the Google Earth Engine. So a few years ago, Google went, we've got a lot of data, we've got a lot of compute. Can we get 
the world's stash of satellite imagery from Earth observation satellites and make that accessible to people. And they've built an application and they've got 10 terabytes of, sorry, 10 petabytes of satellite imagery from across the world, all the Landsat data that I use, MODIS, and a whole lot of other stuff as well. And it allows you to write a few lines of code, like I've written here, and you can build an, a, you know, a, a web application. In this case, this is uh, some nighttime lights data from up in the northern hemisphere, and, and areas that are green are remaining static over time, areas that are red, there's increasing nighttime lights that you're seeing over 10 years, areas that are blue, there's declining. So you can see, you know, Poland's decreasing, um, Ireland's increasing over time. And you can, you know, with this platform, just query data in the cloud. It's amazing. Groups that have used that are, include uh, Global Forest Watch. So they built an app on the Google back end which allows you to, uh, in real time, look at deforestation across the globe. And even for researchers like me, I can build a web page with interactive computation in the back end. So I can build a, a slippy map. Um, but instead of just having a map on the background, in this case here, I've got a map of the amount of cover or ground cover, which is happening in, in this case here in Western Queensland, but you can scroll to anywhere in the globe and it computes in real time. And that, that application there can be used by ecologists and it is being used by ecologists to start looking at the interactions between the ground cover, rainfall and mammal abundance um, in our arid zones. And so the, the actual technology itself allows people to access the algorithms that we develop in the back room and just take it into their own applications. And it, as this leads on, we're, we're seeing sort of more and more of maps as becoming workplace tools. So in this case here, you know, this is an article from Queensland Country Life. Um, Queensland producers lead the way in remote sensing trials. And what they're using here is a nice Google front-end slippy map with a whole lot of Earth observation imagery in the background, and they can start looking at, you know, digitised paddock boundaries in and start looking in real time how their paddocks are performing, which ones are overgrazed, which ones aren't, move their cattle around, look at rainfall in the background. And so, you know, we're starting to see this, this engagement from across a whole range of industries with mapping applications. What kind of interests me, though, is that we're almost getting to the point where we don't need maps anymore. So, I mean, I can buy a chip like this on the internet for, you can buy lots of things on the internet, but I can buy these for $8 on the internet. And it connects to the Wi-Fi, and it's got enough power, enough compute power to hook into Google, you know, the Google APIs. And I can build tools like this, like Dusty. So this tool, I've got one of these sitting at home. There's a lamp on the lounge room, and the lamp changes colour depending on where I am and depending on the surrounding air quality. I've got another one for land cover as well. Um, it doesn't really work all that well in Australia because um, we've really got pretty good air quality. But because it's global, when I'm travelling overseas, I'm in China, you know, whoo, it's, you know, it lights up red and everyone sort of rings me up going, you OK? But <laughs> so I don't need to know, you know, where I'm on the map if there's enough technology there that can, you know, hook my lamp into where I am and you don't need a map in the background. So I guess to finish up in this sort of very quick round trip, you know, it, it's only been 10 years, 10 years since we had that map with just the US and a little bit of the UK. And since then, you know, I'm, I'm going to hear this again and again, sort of, I see quite a few big trends emerging, but the first one is, I guess, really big open spatial data. And so um, you can see there the map on your left. Um, it's a national map, so it's, it's an aggregator put out by uh, NICTA, CSIRO, or Data61 now, which brings a whole lot of spatial data sets which are published by, by government and allows people to grab them, interact with them, put them into their own applications. You're seeing um, hyper-local applications happening, so, you know, like my lamp where I am, um, you can see there's a whole... I build little apps in the background that tell me, for example, my phone is lit up at the moment, it says, you're near the water, which is, you know, duh, the river's just there. Um, but it can compute that on first principles. So when I'm mountain bike riding and I'm near a lake or something like that, it looks at the Earth observation imagery nearby, drills down, runs a water mass and goes, oh, there's water there more than 50% of the time, he might be interested in going and looking, at, looking for birds there and it'll tell me. Um, and we're starting to see, I guess, GIS data what I call their location as a platform. So we're almost getting away from the maps and getting spatial data pushed to us. So this last application here, which is a screen grab from the, from the US, 
and I'll see if this works. So, um, you know, it's possible now by gluing together, when I mean data as a platform, I mean, you know, there's all these little operations that developers and the public can sort of glue together. And if I tap my phone and go, where is the closest forest? Here are the listings. Finding the nearest forest to your current location. Okay, so I can do natural language processing. It goes forest. I want to find forest. Fires off a query. It looks at all the earth observation imagery, processes that, works out which areas are likely to be forest. It will then polygonize that. Forest is at 192 banks, Saint. Okay, so it's, and now it's, it's popping up a map, it's working out the traffic, and it's now rooted me to the nearest forest. So if I wanted to go for a run, which I often do in different places, I don't know where the nearest bit of bush is, I can run a query. And so you can see I'm gluing together voice recognition, satellite image processing, the location APIs and traffic to, to build an app in the background that you know, just helps me in my daily life. And I really see that location as a platform as being you know, the next big thing. Okay, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Peter. Our last speaker before we move to the panel discussion is Dr. Thomas Siegler, who is a lecturer in human geography within the School of Geography, Planning and Environ Management, Environmental Management at the University of Queensland, with expertise in cities, economies, and globalization. And tonight, he's going to be talking about how Google Maps changed the world, but particularly around teaching, and education, and classrooms. Could you please welcome Dr. Thomas Siegler. Thank you all for coming. Uh, as um, the presenter said, my name is Dr. Thomas Sigler. I teach at the University of Queensland in the School of GPAM. Uh, and I don't often talk about teaching, surprisingly, despite the fact that my job title is lecturer. Um, I end up giving most presentations about my research, but this was actually a really interesting uh, point of convergence where I can talk about my teaching. So I'll get started without any further ado. So uh, I'll do sort of past, present, and future, just as Chris did. Uh, and when we think about teaching geography historically, it's historically relied upon this sort of stuff. So uh, it relies upon maps that are static, uh, maps that are often expensive, uh, maps that don't change very often. Oftentimes, they're either projected as political maps or as physical maps, not, not often both. Um, uh, some parts of the world have better mapping cover than others. There are a, a host of problems associated with maps. Now, I will say that I love maps. I have maps all over my walls. I like touching and feeling maps and looking at them, but it's very expensive and very cumbersome to have hundreds of maps uh, on site if you need to teach with them. So, there are three issues that I've identified. One is that they're not dynamic. So, for example, almost no maps have South Sudan or Crimea or some of the newer territories in the world. Um, they're not scalable. So if I'm teaching about a particular city, to zoom into a neighborhood or to zoom out to the wider metropolitan area uh, presents a problem. Uh, and they're not fun, right? I mean, a lot of times, you know, the cartographers, you know, they're, they're tasked with a very specific task. And beyond that, they're not interested in making the, um, making the map fun or exciting in any sort of way. Um, so, for example, we've got three maps here of Chicago. On the left, we've got a map of all the Catholic churches, which is cultural geography. In the middle, we have political geography, or all the jurisdictions. And on the right, we have transport planning, or all the, all the transport routes. And so it takes three maps to show all those. Now, I fish these off the internet, but if you were to happen to want a fourth map showing something else, say racial segregation, it's not guaranteed that you'll find it. Um, whereas Google Maps actually does allow us to, to query various proxies for that. So what, how, does, how does Google Maps change things? How does it allow me to, aside from just doing things in a more fun and cheap way, um, how does it allow me to actually expand the scope of what we can do in the classroom? Um, so one of the things we teach is central place theory, which of those of you who have done geography, you're kind of smirking because it's kind of boring. Um, it's one of the first things you learn when you take a geography course and you learn that the world is made of hexagons, um, that the big, the big red uh, star in the center is, is the large city, and then you have a cascading effect where smaller cities have smaller services. What do I mean by that? If the red star is Brisbane, uh, the, blue, uh, the blue diamonds might be, say, Toowoomba and the Sunshine Coast. The yellow dots might be Dalby and Roma. And then moving right down to, you know, sort of towns that just have one petrol station and that's it. So it's a hierarchy of settlements, right? And that's how Walter Christaller first projected it in 1933 in southern Germany. So how do we actually do that with Google Maps? So here's a map of Australia, and that's where we'll be zooming in on. Um, and if we want to look at something very mundane, let's take Woolies, right? So this is a map of all the Woolworths. 
in the, in the region. As we know, Woolworths is a service that you would use on a daily basis or at least a weekly basis. Uh, you would go to your local grocery store and stock up on what you need. Something that you'd lose, use less frequency, with less frequency, would be a car dealership, for example. So this is a map of all the Holden dealerships, Holden being a relatively common car, no offense. Um, you might use it once or twice in your life, and that's it. And moving to more specialized services, this is the Mercedes dealerships. There may be three in the metropolitan area, as opposed to 10 or 12 Holden dealerships. Uh, apparently, so the, the Midwestern United States is the best place to actually um, to look at central place theory, given that it's a relatively flat, boring place. I can say that. Um, so you've got lots of, this is universities. So this is all the universities, including community colleges, right down to the, the small sort of equivalent of TAFEs um, throughout the Midwest. You have lots of them. They're in almost every major, uh, major city center. Um, looking at airports, so this is international airports, you see that you have to go to a larger city to get an airport. So for example, uh, Quad Cities, Des Moines, uh, Kansas City have larger international airports. And when we look at something even more specialized, plastic surgery, not many people um, getting facelifts and tummy tucks in Minnesota, um, we see that there are just a few of them. So moving right down the urban hierarchy. I also teach ethnic geography. So when I teach on uh, my intro level course, uh, Geog 1000, we talk about how Australian populations increasingly diverse, increasingly cosmopolitan, and spatially distributed, in, especially in cities like Melbourne and Sydney. Uh, so there's a map of ethnic diversity that I fished off of the internet. Um, you can see the red dots, there we go. The red dots indicate 100 citizens born in China. Yellow dots is 100 citizens born in Vietnam. I did not pick the colors. Uh, green indicates 100 citizens born in Italy. Blue is the UK. Uh, moving on to Sydney, for example, you can see some similar patterns. So, for example, there's the Vietnamese community in Cabramatta, uh, the Chinese community in Hurstville, the Chinese community in uh, Chatswood, the Indian community in Parramatta. So, what does that look like when we want to look at ethnicities, say, that aren't on the map? Um, so we can actually do this with Google Maps. So for example, I type in the word Greek, what comes up are both Sublaki shops and Greek Orthodox churches. So we can see that the Greek community uh, clusters just south of Surrey Hills here, as well as a small community in Parramatta. We want to look at the Vietnamese community, we can see a significant cluster here in Cabramatta, as well as what, what's known as Chinatown, just south, south of the CBD. Um, Lebanese, so we get Lebanese clusters in Lakemba, Punchbowl, um, and Bankstown, and so on. Uh, we look at religion. So looking at the religious geographies of Sydney, we can see Catholic, relatively good even distribution of Catholic, as opposed to, say, uh, synagogues, which are a proxy for the Jewish population, located very clustered uh, in close proximity in Bondi and North Bondi. And we look at Muslim populations, so large mosques in Auburn, large mosques in Lakemba, Bankstown, and Punchbowl. So very different ethnic geographies based on what we're looking for um, and who lo who's located where. Um, and the third thing I do, and I'm actually doing pretty well on time, surprisingly, um, is teaching with Street View. So Street View, as numerous speakers have mentioned, is, is literally uh, mapping the world with a car or I guess now a bicycle. Um, they go around and take really, really good photos, and here's a map of the coverage. So you can see it's not the whole world, but it's a lot of the world, um, and that's very detailed imagery. It's, it's 360 degrees, as I said. If you, Google, uh, if you Google Google Street View, you can come up with some pretty funny things of things they photographed, uh, dead bodies and people getting held up at knife point and things like that. Uh, but that's not what I'm teaching about. I'm teaching about suburban geographies. Um, so we teach a lecture called Australia and the Suburban Dream when we talk about how um, people's imagery of what, what they expect in life to own sort of, uh, you know, a car and a garage and a, a 2.5 uh, people in their home and a white picket fence and all those things has changed over time from relatively small blocks and relatively close proximity to places like North Lakes, which are being marketed as sort of master plan communities. Um, and Brisbane over time has gotten larger, going from a relatively small core, um, just gotten larger and larger as suburban sprawl has moved outward. So how do we do that without actually visiting those areas? We actually do in some courses, but in other courses we just don't have time, we can't afford to take a bus trip everywhere. So we go to West End, which is relatively central. The houses are relatively close together. We can see the setbacks between houses is relatively small. We then go to Camp Hill, which is slightly further out in the suburbs. We see the houses expand, the houses get bigger, the setbacks get bigger. We go even further out to Forest Lake, we see the setbacks get even bigger, the focus becomes on the garage because it's now car-based rather than public transport-based urbanization, and so on. In teaching post-industrial geographies, this is exceptionally useful. We don't have many of them in Australia, outside of, say, Newcastle and Wollongong. So I teach about the United States, I teach about the UK. So I can actually take students to, say, Detroit, um, and this is an actual street view that I took, um, to Burnley in the UK, 
uh, or to Skid Row. These are homeless people in Skid Row in Los Angeles when I'm talking about um, the social transformations and social displacements endemic to post-industrial landscapes. Um, I talk about slums in the developing world in my urban geography class. So amazingly, Google has really good street views um, in Brazil, so I can go right into Rio de Janeiro, put the little man down in the middle of a favela and actually show students what it's like, and we talk about the different urbanization issues that Rio de Janeiro faces. I can put the little man down in Dhaka in Bangladesh, amazing street coverage. Uh, we can actually look at different forms of mobility, um, different forms of slum settlements, and how urbanization differs from context to context. Uh, we can go to Johannesburg in South Africa, where we can look at the post-apartheid city. This is actually from Soweto Township, so we can see things made of improvised materials, um, and jury rigged wiring, and so on and so forth. So, what's the future of Google Maps? I think the other speakers have done a pretty good job um, explicating on what that might look like. Um, but we've got a variety of options here. We've got augmented reality. Um, so where you could actually use Oculus Rift or some sort, of, some sort of virtual reality or some sort of enhancement device to tell you what might be in your immediate vicinity when your immediate vicinity um, is not familiar to you. Um, 3D projections using LiDAR, using a variety of technologies to actually enhance things beyond that two-dimensional scope that you get. All right, so without further ado, I think that's it. All right. Uh, at this point, I'd love to invite all the speakers to make your way up on stage. Sorry, you've just sat down again, uh, Thomas. But, uh, and we're going to come around. If you've got questions there, if you could wave them around in the air, and we will come and collect some of those off you. Meanwhile, we will pull up Twitter as well. So, um, just while we're all getting settled and getting some of the questions here, next month, 7th of December, we're having our final Briz Science of the Year, and we're going to be talking about Mars. So, we're going to be talking about uh, NASA's role there, is there the possibility of life on Mars, um, what does the future of Mars exploration look like, a variety of topics there. We'll have a few speakers who will be part of a panel again. So, it should be a really great talk to end the year. Um, and I would definitely encourage you to book ahead quickly for that one. Um, all right, so we, uh, we're just getting set up with microphones there. Um, so hopefully they should be fine. Thank you kindly. All right. So um, first question, this is from Twitter, um, was talking about university students. And I don't know whether, Thomas, you're the best person to answer this, but anyone chime in. About university students who often do the same uh, prac work in every, every year at the same location, is it the possibility of crowdsourced um, data from university courses? You know, can, can we use these students to do something useful? I think it's the intent there. Uh, I assume this is one from one of my students. Um, uh, yeah, look, I think it's got a lot of possibilities. I'll deviate a little bit to answer that question. But uh, for example, most, if not all, of my students these days have mobile phones. Most of them have smartphones. And um, when we do GIS, we teach GIS on machines. And sometimes we buy these really expensive devices to do GPS you know, GPS-based labs. Instead of doing that, you can actually send the students out with their mobile phones. They can download an app that's free. They can take waypoints. Um, and then they can bring that back to the classroom a half an hour later and see what everyone saw in practically in real time in front of the, uh, in front of the class. So yeah, I think there are definitely ways to do that. And I think, um, you know, as universities evolve, I think part of that is distance learning. And I think, you know, the data that distance learning brings is definitely relevant. Right. All right, we have a couple of questions coming in along uh, privacy. So how do you protect privacy? Question here from Twitter, Carlos Estrada um, asks, saying, you know, affordable geospatial data is exciting, but what about privacy issues and new forms of marginalization? So how do you think privacy interacts with this new world? I'm happy Just to... an easy question to get a start. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll have a crack and then hopefully someone else far more knowledgeable can take over because, I mean, really, I probably observed I'm the only one up here who's not actually paid to do this stuff for a living. I'm actually a town planner. I do this because I love it. Um, and, but I, 
but also because I, I genuinely think that we can use this kind of technology to make better cities, which is what I'm, a, I'm about trying to use this stuff. But anyway, um, but that presents a challenge. There's no doubt that this privacy and how we use crowdsource data or just all this data presents a massive privacy issue. Um, I just hope that we can find a way through that because it just, it kind of bugs me, you know, that we've got this enormous amount of data there. To me, it's like having a Ferrari and leaving it stuck in first gear, you know. You've got all this data out there. You know it's out there, yet we're not using it to make smart decisions, you know. It's kind of like having having a new uh, drug that the University of Queensland invented, we just keep it on the shelf rather than letting it out there and help solve things in the city. So I understand we have to work that through, but I just hope that we can push through it because I think it would be horrific if we, um, if we let that issue, one issue alone, stop some of these amazing opportunities in the way our cities will work in the future. Because I think the reality of, for cities like Brisbane, um, we can't, we're not going to grow, or we will reach a point where our cities won't function unless we can come up and be smart cities. You know, Tokyo at 40 million people only functions because they have such advanced ways of moving people and places around. And if we're not willing to do that, then Brisbane is going to become a horrific place to live because we need to get a, to be smarter in how we live. Anyone else have any comments there? Um, I guess I might just add, I'm probably in a unique position where I work with enterprises who use mapping technology sort of behind the closed door. So a lot of this stuff that we're talking about is actually already happening. It's just not in the public domain. So things like crowdsourcing data, you know, working with, um, you know, a major utility at the moment where they're looking at, you know, getting the public to, you know, send in photos of damage and all that sort of stuff. So the t technology is there to support it. I think we're just in a transition phase between, you know, how we sort of manage, what's the governance around making that information accessible and have more people actually take advantage of that. Um, I think probably the privacy issue, um, I think Chris, you touched on it where we were talking about, um, you know, like say push notifications, you know, you walk past a store, you've opted into a, a, an app which says, you know, when I go past a 7-Eleven and they've got a deal on this, I want to be, you know, geofencing, I want to be notified so I can go in and, and, and get that sort of... Um, take advantage of that offer. That's the real privacy thing I see at the moment. It's because it's, it's a bit creepy, right? You know, you're walking past a shop and then you get this thing on your phone going, come in, we, we know your behaviours, um, come, come and buy this ridiculously priced product. Um, so I think at the moment it's a, very much you're opting into things, but, you know, who knows? Who knows in the future how we're actually going to manage it? Yeah, I think um, one, of the, one of the more... I find exciting, but other people find terrifying examples was the release of the New York City taxi data set. So all the taxi journeys that people took in New York over the, the time of the year were released. They were they sort of anonymised, um, but there was enough information left in there in, in terms of times that within about an hour, people had ingested into a large um, cloud compute system and they'd cross-referenced it with location-based tweets and they'd worked out where all the celebrities were, where they'd travelled to, where they'd eaten that night and things like that. So it becomes quite hard to, you know, because we leak information everywhere. We've got our tweets, we've got, you know, location, Uber, things like that, um, to not leave a digital trail. But I think there's, there is work underway in, in, in ways of analysing these data sets where, you know, the data never comes out of encryption, but that's, that's for another... One of the things I said earlier was that I think in some of the, where we've got these big data sets that are coming from a lot of different sources, it's the only thing that's tying them together is geography, mm. right? It's yeah. the only thing. So that's why yeah, it's so important that, you know, we sort of, you know, look at maps and yeah. mapping technology. Yeah. Mm. So perhaps we've got a, a follow-up question here that ties into the other side of that, is who owns this data? Um, and I guess if I can expound a little bit more broadly on that, you know, some people who are you know, open street maps at the one hand, which is meant to be completely open source, free data. Uh, then you've got Google who's asking for contributions, but they presumably are going to use for their own commercial gain, but also our benefit. You know, how does that work? Do you think everyone is being fairly compensated for their crowdsourced efforts? <laughs> <laughs> Ominous silence. Location data is, is so valuable to, to businesses um, because it, it, location is everything. Um, and I don't know what the answer is. I'm, I'm comfortable with sharing my location in return for services so, you know, so that I, I know that the, the traffic's going to be bad when I go to pick the kids up from school and so I need to leave a little bit earlier. But other people won't be. And... Um, 
there's a whole swag of issues there around, around privacy and what we're giving up in order to get these services from these corporations. I think I was going to say, I, I expect you'll find if anyone's ever bothered to read all 33 and however many pages of the terms and conditions on every app that you subscribe to, somewhere buried in that would say that you've given up your right to the ownership of that data or the, the ability, to, you've, you've waived stuff. That's what happens when you go accept um, and don't read it. Um, but you know, and, but there's different things, you know, like Google, um, there is options that you can let it track you or not, you know, that's a privacy setting and I can sit on there. Um, something for everyone to go do when you go home, if you just type your name into Google Maps, so as opposed to searching your name in Google, type your name into Google Maps, um, it actually knows where you've been. Um, when I do it, it comes up that I studied at the University of Queensland, um, but if I actually click on a function and let it know that, that I'm, a, I'm open for people to, to let me know further, it'll actually share my day and with different people and those kind of things. So, um, w but again, that's a function I've turned on, but it doesn't turn on by default. It's a, that one is an optional function I have to turn on, but um, I suspect the answer, in many instances, that we waive our rights to own this data simply by signing up to these apps. Mm -hmm. And geotagging, you know, Twitter, the geotags at all, and that's just the choice you use to other bits and pieces. Thomas, at the risk of painting you in the teacher hat again, because I know you actually do real research as well, um, but what do you know, the students you've got coming through, how, how do they feel about this? You know, the people who are going into geography, are they sort of gung-ho and happy to share and that's, that's, they've got great ideas for how we can do more the more that people share? Or is there some of the reservations that Chris sort of touched on? Uh, there's been a sea change in attitudes in the last 10 years. I mean, I've been teaching about 10 years, and I think in that 10 years it went from being sort of a cool new topic to something, I mean, I, I can't update my slides fast enough to reflect this stuff. Um, I mean, even teaching about transport geographies, teaching about various mechanisms for car sharing. I mean, everyone in the class has taken Uber. So it already it becomes a dated lecture, you know, as of six months ago. Um, so really, as, a, as, a, as an instructor, you yourself need to keep up on these technologies to make sure you're not teaching dated information. And I think it's really important um, to, to reach a fine line where you're actually still revisiting some of the theory that's very relevant and not selling yourself short you know, as a discipline and a core set of ideas, but at the same time applying those to things like Uber and Twitter that everyone knows about and are really relevant to the classroom. Yep. Um, we have one question here which... Um, maybe you have some thoughts, is what's the best way to learn GIS? We mentioned sort of the democratisation of, of this kind of thing. You know, if people want to get more involved in this, what should they do? Where should they start? Um, I, I can probably give a little bit of a plug here. Um, there's <laughs> some, there are some sort of MOOCs that are available if you wanted to look at learning the ArcGIS platform. So there's a lot of, um, you know, sort of free access to our mapping technology and courses that are available. Um, but yeah, there's so much online, right? Um, you know, online resources, there's web, um, web courses. Um, I, my day job is in mapping technology and there is just so much out there and I'm just thankful that it's all on the internet because, you know, you sit there and you can take advantage of it when you need to get up to date on what's happening. So I think um, there's a lot of Penn State stuff as well out there. Yeah. Yeah, so a friend of mine named Anthony Robinson taught a class called Maps in the Geospatial something or other, and he had 70,000 students. Um, he taught what's called a massive online open course, or a MOOC. Um, anyone in the world can sign up for it for free. You only have to pay if you actually want assessment. And so, yeah, including his grandmother. He said his, he was most nervous about his grandmother taking the course <laughs> out of, out of 70,000 students. But yeah, he's run it twice now, and um, it's, yeah, it's a great way that you know, children in Uganda can take a Penn State level you know, mapping course and, and actually learn something. And there's an incredible amount on YouTube. I mean, there's this, you know, you read any newspaper about a higher education and they'll say higher education is coming under threat from uh, for-profit educational providers. I mean, you can go on YouTube and learn GIS. There's nothing to say you can't, right? So it's, it's the onus is on us to keep, to keep up with it um, and really to make sure we're one step ahead in adding value to, to that educational experience. All right, one final question, uh, and hopefully you all have some good reasons, but what are the best Easter eggs that you have found on any maps? <laughs> Meaning the fun things that, you know, perhaps map makers have added or Google has added and so forth. Um, and we talked a little bit about this beforehand, um, Tom was saying about how the map makers used to make one error on every map so they would, people would know it was theirs. So if you zoom into Russell Square in London, 
at a certain, it actually photographed a, a 747 landing in Heathrow, and it's, it's the square, it's actually superimposed on top of the square. I spend, I spend way too much time on Google Maps in my spare time. <laughs> Uh, look, I, in doing some of the research for this, I found one of interesting. Again, it's such a personal taste and so much out there. I found some guys in, in London have started to map where all of the, the, the plague burial grounds are. So for those people who love having kind of slightly darker holidays, um, you can travel to London and actually go, you know, to, and it, it knows where you are and it kind of can point you to that was a grave over there and those kind of things. So whether that's an Easter egg or, or, or black Easter egg, I don't know. but. <laughs> Slightly along that topic, I have a new favourite Instagram account that I follow called Sad Topographies, and it's got ex examples of places with depressive names, So, and it's like, you know, places to go when you're feeling low. So if you want to see some uh, sad map names, um, yeah, have a look at Sad Topographies. It's quite cool. One of my favourite ones, because um, I'm also on the group that maps where land clearing is across Queensland. And a few years ago, uh, a certain land owner in Queensland, Blade ploughed some words into his paddock using some sort of precision agriculture techniques. And I can't actually mention uh, what they <laughs> ploughed in <laughs> to this audience, but come see me afterwards. But it, um, yeah, it's, it's just a couple of words, um, obviously with the knowledge that we would pick that up and, and hopefully take their advice. <laughs> Well, we'll look forward to your tweet with the latitude and longitude after the program. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on that resounding note, could you please thank our fantastic panel, Chris, Alex, Peter and Thomas. Thank you very much. We'll see you all back on the 7th. And, sorry, a, which I've neglected to mention, a very special thank you um, because our original speaker, Steve Jacoby, um, was unfortunately unable to make it at the last minute. So Alex stepped in and um, taught us everything we need to know about Pompeii's emergency defences. So thank you, Alex. Um, Please join us for some food outside. The speakers will follow shortly.